This video is about the link between the Benedictines, especially St. Benedict's Abbey Ealing, and the school, St. Benedict's School, Jimmy Savile and the BBC and British institutions, as well as the Catholic Church institution. Reading from Skeptical Thoughts blog spot by Jonathan West, or John West, one of the reasons Shipley is the ex-abbot of St. Benedict's Abbey and one of the ex-headmasters, and Clue, I think, is the ex-headmaster of the senior school. One of the reasons Shipley and Clue, Clue did what they did was that they could, like the BBC. There was no effective support or supervision from elsewhere in the church that would prevent them from, doing, from going off the rails. In fact, it can be argued that they were, in fact, not doing anything out of the ordinary by church standards, but faithfully reflecting the culture and practices of the church as a whole. And what we're going to see is that the BBC did exactly the same thing, because institutions, institutions that work for the state, institutions that work for the cabal, are all set up in the same way, and that is to not protect children. And when sexual abuse does occur, um, to protect the abuser and to suppress the abusee. As the BBC continued to deny that they had any knowledge of the alleged assaults, a former press officer for the corporation has admitted that the controller of Radio 1 asked him to look into abuse rumours in the 1970s. So what we see is that the institutions such as the BBC and the church become incompetent in order to police themselves. And when the abuse gets out of control and people start to come forward, then they ask the police to intervene. In the BBC's case, they have their internal process and the church also have their internal process to help them police themselves. But very rarely do they ask outside institutions to come in because they're always trying to cover up, they're always trying to protect themselves. The church and the church and the BBC claim that they haven't had allegations or they cover up the allegations, they obfuscate the allegations. And this is one of the essential parts in covering up and helping the paedophile is to say that there were no sexual assault allegations. And what we're going to find with the BBC is that there were sexual assault allegations going back to the 1970s, which nobody did anything about. And we're going to have a look at the Catholic Church, especially the abbot president of the, um, at that time, uh, 2001 to 2017, which is Richard Yeo, who was a downside boy, who was at the same school as the current abbot president, which is Christopher Jameson. And what we're going to see is they help to obfuscate the evidence and the allegations and they do very little to pass them to the police. Shipley got, ex-abbot Shipley got into a large amount of trouble because he didn't hand over, um, he was told by I think the Westminster Diocese to hand over bits of paper to the police which he didn't and I think that was 2011. A raft of former BBC presenters and producers have come out of the woodwork to say his behaviour was an open secret. This is what happens after there is an exposure of the paedophile, then people start to come out of the woodwork. The teachers at St Benedict's, the priests at St Benedict's, they start to come out, especially the teachers and the staff and the students. While at the same time, those very people kept their mouths closed because they don't want to lose their jobs, they don't want to get into trouble, they don't want to have a bad press, they don't want to bring something that they like into disrepute. So they always put the institution, whether it's the BBC or the Catholic Church or the school or the Abbey, in front of the sexual abuse victim. And what happens is, is that the victim, uh, the abuse gets more and more and more, it builds up and up and up, and then at the end of the day, it all cascades, when in fact, had the person or the teacher or the staff known what was going, who knew what was going on, done something at that moment, they would have stopped the inevitable cast, uh, they would have stopped the inevitable implosion of the system. But did those further up the corporate food chain know? In the 70s, Radio 1 controller, the late Douglas Muggeridge, asked a press officer to find out whether the tabloids were looking into the rumours. He was told they weren't, and it ended there. People up the ladder, they know that there are rumours, allegations and complaints. But what they're interested in is if it's got to the public, which is exactly what St Benedict's School did. They knew that David Pearce and Lawrence Soper were abusing boys. And they did nothing because it hadn't yet got into the public domain. What they were more interested in doing 
like the, the leaders in the BBC, was protecting the institution. Going back to Jonathan West, he reports, the report had specific examples of Yo's failure, who's the Abbott president. For instance, and I quote, at some point, Abbott Ortigia learned of allegations of a child abuse against Pierce and he passed on the information to Tom Richard Yo, the Abbott president, when Yo became Abbott president in 2001. However, Abbott president Yo did nothing about Pierce at this point. He did nothing at this point because it hadn't come out into the press. We're talking about 2001 at this point. But when the allegations start to come out in 2006, he does something about it. Because the allegations weren't coming out into the press against the BBC and Jimmy Savile, nothing got done. Of Yo's first visitation to Ealing in 2003, because the abbot president does visitations of monasteries. So you have an abbot in a monastery, but when the abbot president goes to the monastery, the abbot is no longer in control. He becomes subordinate and the abbot president takes up the abbotcy of that individual monastery, which is an agreement all monasteries have. In 2003, when abbot president Yeo conducted his first visitation on Ealing Abbey, several monks told him of their concerns about Pierce, just like um, staff and people at the BBC had brought up concerns about Jimmy Savile. They complained that he was not being reined in as he should have been. By this time he hadn't been, he hadn't gone to court. 2003, 2006 is when he loses the civil court case and it comes out into the press. So the monks are already saying to the abbot president, look, yeah, he's out of control, rein him in, which are very, which is good that the monks are doing this. And gave examples of how Pierce would pass through the school in order to reach some offices. So he was going through the canteen, he was taken, Pierce was taken out of the school and he was made the bursar. And when he was the bursar, the, the offices were in the canteen and to get to the canteen you had to go through the lines of the boys so he always had access to the boys through the offices and that's why he was going to the offices so he could speak to the boys he spoke to Abbot Shipley about it the concern presumably being that Pierce could engineer access to children under this pretext which he did he spoke to Abbot Shipley about it and said that Pierce should not be going through the school. However, Abbot President Yeo did not record the details of that advice, nor did he address it in his report to the monks as a whole, which basically means he didn't say it. It does not appear that he was treating the issue with due seriousness. In, this, in his evidence to us, Dom Yeo criticised Abbot Shipley, saying that it all seemed to be rather casual. However, his own approach was no less so. And we see the same thing at the BBC, where we have a producer, manager, leader who doesn't take it seriously because the press aren't saying anything about it. Therefore, he doesn't need to do anything about it. As an organisation, they probably didn't, but certain people must have been aware of rumours. And now the BBC has to fight the possibility that things actually took place on their premises. And I would think horrified would be the right way of describing it, yes. The BBC aren't horrified that anything happened on their premises. The BBC are horrified that they've been caught. And this is what happened with Prince Andrew. The Royal Protection Team knew that Epstein was a paedophile. A paedophile. They allowed, or Andrew forced himself into that paedophile's house. He didn't listen to his protection team. The royal family threatened journalists not to report on the royal family. They knew what Prince Andrew had done, but they never castigated him for it until it went into the public papers. Because the royal family, St. Benedict's, the Benedictines, the Catholic Church and the BBC, they're not interested in paedophilia. They're interested in being caught. No concrete evidence has emerged of any sort of cover-up at the BBC. The question remains, though, if it was an open secret, why, for so long, did it stay as just a secret? This is what happened at St Benedict's. The monks knew that David Pearce was a paedophile. They knew, ship, they knew Soper was a paedophile. They did nothing. The cover-up is not covering something up. The covering up is not doing anything and allowing it to persist 
and not giving people access to the information freely and making it difficult for that access to happen, which is what St. Benedict's did with to the police. They didn't freely give access to information. You had to know what the information was before you asked, before you before they gave it to you, which was one of the problems in RCA6's case. When R, well, this is even worse because in RCA6's case, when his lawyers asked for further information concerning boys X, Y, and Z, which the monastery did have, Shipley or the monastery or whoever had those documents didn't give it over. Shipley was the abbot at that time. He'd also been headmaster of the junior school at that time after David Pierce, but he apparently didn't have access to those documents. Where were those documents? Is the BBC has been pretty horrified and appalled by by the the testimony of some of the women who appeared in the ITV documentary. This is what the institutions do when they when it finally comes out what's happened. Like Saint Benedict's, they start apologising. Saint Benedict's apologised at the ICSA. Uh, the lawyer, female lawyer, stood up and said on behalf of Saint Benedict's, we were terribly sorry. Didn't mean it. Um, the abbot at Saint Benedict's at the moment. Dom Dominic Taylor said sorry on the website for all the all the terrible things that um, had happened to the uh, to the abuse victims, but they don't mean it either. Sorry is a fantastic word because you just need to say because you just need to say it, and suddenly people think that all of the problems go away in the world. So the first thing that these institutions do after they've been caught out is to apologise. We're we're very keen that that uh, as much evidence of what actually went on and and uh, that people who have evidence of what actually went on should come forward and give it to the police, give it to the BBC who will pass it on to the police so that there can be the, the fullest possible investigation into what Jimmy Savile was or was not doing. And they have their transcript. You need to go to the police, you need to report these things, we're going to help the police, we're part of the, we're part of the team to help uncover the cover-up and they pre and they present themselves as heroes suddenly oh we didn't know but now we know now we're going to do something about it we have spoken to rodney collins who was a pr at the time at the bbc who was asked by douglas mogridge who was controller of radio one then uh, to uh, check up uh, to see whether a story which suggested that jimmy savile was uh, not up to uh, was up to some pretty bad stuff to see if any of it was going to be published. Does that ring any bells with you? Well, it doesn't ring any bells in the sense that I don't know any more about that than, than you do from having read newspaper accounts of it recently. But what's quite clear is that over the period of Jimmy Savile's employment at the BBC and during his other activities, there were rumours about Jimmy Savile. The problem seems to be that, that certainly from the BBC's trawl of its records, we can find no evidence that hard allegations were made or hard evidence were offered against him. Concerning allegations which are purported not to have been made to the BBC, there is another argument that says that allegations were made to the BBC. And if they weren't allegations, they were rumours, but they were certainly strong enough rumours for the BBC One controller in the 1970s, Douglas Muggeridge, to appoint his press officer, Rodney Collins, to go and look at the tabloid newspapers to see if they were going to print any stories on Jimmy Savile. So allegations or rumours uh, that were enough for a BBC One controller to intervene, that's, that's strong enough, isn't it? But this, this was actually part of the difficulty the BBC had. They'd built Jimmy Savile up into a massive brand. They were party to the good Jimmy Savile, and really the last thing they wanted on earth was the bad Jimmy Savile. This is all about branding. You need to create something, you need to advertise it, and then you need the PR. You have the creation of Christianism, you sell it through Jesus, and then you keep the PR going through the Roman Catholic Church. And it's the same with the BBC. The BBC have created, or well, the creation of the BBC, then they advertise themselves through uh, Jimmy Savile, and then they need to do Jimmy Savile's PR. They can't have a priest. The priest and Jimmy Savile are the same thing. They can't have a priest fall and they can't have Jimmy Savile fall because if Jimmy Savile or a priest falls, then they think it's got a very bad repercussion on the BBC or the church. In fact, if those people suddenly out them, then the public opinion is going to be, thank you for taking very swift action. But these institutions, it's not that they don't think like that, it's that they're programmed to 
be part of the system. And the system, the, the essential system, global cabal system, essentially seems to work on cults. And these cults, if you go back in time long enough, you can trace these, these cults going back through the Masons, going back through the Templars, the Ros Rosicrucians. You can then go into the religious cults of the Gnostics, which were, seem to be quite a good cult. You can then go into the cults of the Romans, into the cults of the Greeks. Then you can go into the cults of the Hebrews, into the cults of the Egyptians. In the Egyptian cults, you've got the cult of Seth. In the Hebrews and the Israelites, you've got the cult of Baal, Moloch, Molech, um, Baal Hadid. And these cults seem to have uh, participated in um, a lot of sex and uh, orgy activity as well as child sacrifice. Paedophilia is the type of child sacrifice. Because today you, you can't kill a child, it's, it's illegal to kill a child. You can still sacrifice the child by committing paedophilia, destroying the child's life, which is the sacrifice, while still keeping the child alive. And because the child doesn't know what's gone on, because the child goes on to drugs, they've got a special law, which is to do with character. If your character isn't good, then the witness, then you are not a good witness. The police don't really think that you are a good witness. So if you get sexually abused and then you get hooked on drugs and then you commit crime, when you then make allegations against the abuser, they say, well, look, he's got a bad character. And that's how paedophilia pedi works. It's got this inbuilt technolog technological system whereby the person that wishes to complain has destroyed his life so much that it starts to work against him. So you could, these systems like the, like the media, like the BBC, the BBC is the propaganda arm of the British public. It's what feeds them their information. And the BBC have been outed because of, the, of these problems. If you look at Dr. Steve Tully or you look at um, London Real, you can see evidence that these institutions are losing more and more support as people like David Icke, like London Real, like Sean Atwood, they, they're all starting to come out, these independent people, giving the truth, giving real stories, which contradict what the mainstream cults like the BBC are saying. Uh, and this, this surely comes to a head right there uh, in the last few months when you have that collision between wanting to go stole uh, Jimmy Savile in that uh, Jim will fix it special after he died and Newsnight's determination to try and expose him. Well, I've not known any manager at the BBC who, however big the star, would have been prepared to tolerate the kind of behaviour which we now have alleged against Sir Jimmy Savile and which there's really significant evidence to suggest he was guilty of. This is very interesting. Let me just repeat this. Uh, he doesn't know any manager at the BBC who, however big the star, would have been prepared to tolerate the kind of behaviour which we now have alleged against Savile, which there is now significant evidence to suggest he was guilty. When these leaders, controllers, abbots, uh, president abbots, abbot presidents, they don't want to know the truth. They don't investigate the truth so that everything remains rumour. Because they know if they investigate the rumour and they find out the truth, then they've got to do something about it. So these controllers, yeah, they did the best that they possibly could in the circumstances with the information. But they purposely made themselves ignorant by stopping them get access to the information so that they could make decisions as ignorant people that then in the future, if, this, if things ever came out, which everything does, they could be excused for not having that information. And you can see the same pattern at St. Benedict's as well, where the abbot presidents or the abbots, they don't want to investigate. And so what happens is, based on the limited information they have, they make their decisions, which happen to support the Catholic Church, the cabal and the cult. I give you an example. Abbot President Yo in 2009, he wrote a report for the Holy See, which is the Pope and his people, following the EBCs, that's the English Benedictine Congregation's general chapter. By that time, Pierce had been charged with abuse of RCA 621, which would have been, I think, in 2008. A current pupil at St. Benedict's committed while under restrictions. Ah, 
Now, that would have been after 2006, but I think before 2008. So it's between those times. However, Abbot President Yeo's report to the Holy See, the Pope, said only that there is a court case pending which could cause serious damage to Ealing Abbey. It needs to be stressed that the problems arise as a result of abuse that is revealed to have taken place many years ago. That abuse hadn't taken place many years ago. That, that abuse had just taken place because in 2006, when Pierce was was done for civil damages, he went back to the monastery and within, I don't know, six months or a year, two years, he then abused another boy. Abbot Yo hasn't done his research. Abbot Yo is not interested. Why, why are you reporting sexual abuse to the Holy See and not getting your facts correct? Because it's not important. As Jonathan West says, there were two mistakes here. First, Abbot President Yo's assumption that the abuse was entirely historic negative. Second, his representation of it as such without checking the facts. These illustrate a failure to obtain a proper understanding of the problem. Just like the controller at the BBC didn't want to investigate. Again, Jonathan West very cleverly goes on to say, I would suggest that a further issue is that, as expressed in his report to the Holy See, Yo's primary concern is the possibility of serious damage to Ealing Abbey. And the controller did exactly the same thing. Because nothing was coming out in the press to damage the BBC, that was the most important thing. These two institutions are working in exactly the same way. Let's turn then to your investigations that are going on now. What are they? Well, what we've done is to make available our investigations unit at the BBC to help the police in any inquiries they can make. What is what that? That's a gr group BBC, of journalists, is Going it? on to the BBC. Is that a group of no, journalists no, that's or what? A, that's a, no, no, that's a group of mainly former ex-policemen, actually, who work in the BBC investigating things on behalf of the BBC. So they're empowered to help the police in any way that they can to investigate the allegations that we made about Jimmy Savile and any other allegations that they want investigated. Do you think... So this is in-house. What you do is you get your Abbott president and you get your special people that make extraordinary visitations and they go through everything and they can they help help the police if they need to help the police but it's all in-house so the public doesn't know what's going on so victims out there or people out there that may contradict or may help with with evidence or with facts they can't do it because it's all kept private this needs to be public you shouldn't have your own police force within the bbc to go and see what you think is right and wrong and to make the investigations that you want and then help the police in the same way that there shouldn't be extraordinary visitations or Vatican visitations into St. Benedict's Abbey. It should be done by an external force because they hide things. They don't tell the public the truth. And if they've got a victim or they find a victim or they see something's gone wrong, they're not gonna go and contact the victim. And I know this because when, say, when David Pierce was drawing boys at St. Benedict's, he was touching many, many, many of their penises and St. Benedict's has never written to those boys to ask if they would like to come forward. So what happens if those kids are perhaps in different countries or they've left, they've left to different places and they don't know what's been going on? They could be contacted, maybe something else happened to them and they need help to come forward, but no. Do the, in do the investigation in-house so nobody else knows. I, I certainly do think there was a different culture in, in, in that era in the 60s and 70s in relation to child protection. There was a different culture, but I don't recollect a culture in which it was acceptable for a 30 or 40 year old man to push a, a young woman aged 14 or 15 up against a wall and sexually molest her. I don't think that was acceptable at any time in the past or in the present. And that's an interesting point because Ratzinger said that part of the problem with paedophilia has come after the Second Vatican Council with sexual liberalism. Yet, everyone fails to mention that the Didache, which was a, a piece of writing which set up the, um, the ideology of the Christian uh, faith, says quite clearly in it, you must not corrupt young boys, pointing specifically to paedophilia. So paedophilia isn't something that came in 1966 after the Vatican, pa Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council, and uh, liberalism and sexualization of youth. It's been going on since 
since the 109 uh, AD when the Didi when the Didache was written. Not not only that is that paediophilia in the past wasn't recognised. It was only up until the 19th century that there was actually an age of consent. Going back four five hundred years um, to, to a thousand years, two thousand years, you could marry a girl at seven years old. You could marry a girl at ten years old. The age of consent was ten years old in Britain up until the late uh, 1800s. Then it got moved up to 13, and then it got moved up to 16. But the age of consent for a very long time was about 10 years old. So paedophilia, what we count as paedophilia today, wasn't counted as paedophilia in the past. But that doesn't mean to say that having sex with a prepubescent girl is right. It just means that the public didn't see it as a bigger problem as what we see it today.